Welcome to the Matter and Temperature tutorial. This tutorial matches up with section 8-1 in the reading packet that I gave you. And it goes from pages 214 to page 220. So in this part of the packet, a number of things are covered. First of all, it mentions four states of matter. There's actually a fifth one also that's not mentioned in the textbook that we might talk about later. And it talks about the kinetic theory of matter and how that theory explains the changes from one state to another. So basically, what that theory says is that if you look at matter at its smallest level, it's made up of particles. Those particles are in constant motion. So even though it looks like the particles in this solid aren't moving, we would say that they have vibrational motion that's very hard to detect, but is there. We'll do some experiments that help you see it. And then the liquid particles have some freer motion. They actually can sort of rotate around each other. And I show that with curved arrows. Very hard to make curved arrows in that tiny space. And then a gas is very free, and the particles can bounce around in straight lines. And then a plasma is a lot like a gas, only it's a gas that is so hot that when it crashes and collides with things, the individual particles break apart into the subparticles. So the little blue things represent atoms, and atoms are actually made of smaller pieces. In the nucleus of the atom, you have protons and neutrons, but we're only showing the nucleus of the atom as a red, with, red dot with a positive sign in the middle. If you look close to see that little positive sign. And electrons, which sort of orbit around that nucleus, and they have a negative charge. And normally, the atom is all put together so that you have the electrons orbiting around the nucleus. But in a plasma, those electrons get temporarily knocked away. And as a result, a plasma has a charge to it. And it also gives off light. It gives off different rays of light. And we get different colors of gas, different colors of light, I'm sorry, from different gases that turn to a plasma. And this is part of the reason why a flame has a color to it. It's because a flame is, is a form of energy that's created when um, matter is really, really hot. And so some of that matter is turning to a plasma, and as a result, it's giving off light. So those are the four states of matter that are mentioned in the section. And, and it also talks about the characteristics of each state of matter. So it talks about how solids have definite shape and definite volume. And what they mean by that is just that the solid holds its shape unless something, you know, like a person or an object deforms it, and it maintains the amount of space that it takes up. It doesn't expand or contract unless something causes that to happen. Liquids, on the other hand, they have definite volume, but they do not have a definite shape. And when we're saying that since you don't have a definite shape, that's called an indefinite shape. And all that means is that if you pour a liquid from one container to another, it changes to take on the shape of the container it's in. On the other hand, the spacing between the molecules is fixed, so the amount of space it takes up stays the same. A gas is much more free in its motion, and so it has indefinite shape and indefinite volume. And that's also true of a plasma. It also has an indefinite shape and an indefinite volume. What that means is that both a gas and a plasma will expand to fill whatever container we allow them to be in. And that's because of the freedom of motion that those particles have. Those particles are moving really, really rapidly, bouncing off of everything, including each other. And so they have this tendency to expand out infinitely away from each other if you'll let them. The next thing that comes up in the tutorial is two types of solids. And the names of these two types of solids are crystalline solids and non-crystalline solids. Simply put, crystalline solids are solids that form in a rigid pattern and create a crystal. So you can see on this side we have a crystalline solid that forms a crystal. On the other side, we have a solid that is rigid, but it's not in a pattern per se. And so we refer to this as non-crystalline, or sometimes as amorphous, which is a little more difficult to spell. Amorphous means literally not a shape. That's what morph means. It means to be in a particular shape. So um, if, you're amorph if you're an amorphous solid, you don't have individual crystals. And you can see crystals under a microscope. If you look at something like salt or sugar, or a piece of quartz, you can actually see the individual crystals, which are just big clumps of molecules that follow the same pattern over and over and over again. So a snowflake is an example of a crystal of water. So when water freezes, it tends to freeze in a pattern that's very, very obvious. 
And that's true of most solids. Some of them, however, just don't do that. The last thing that gets brought up in the reading packet is this concept called thermal expansion. Thermal refers to heat and expansion refers to getting bigger. And in general, not always, there are exceptions, but generally speaking, most forms of matter expand when heated. This includes solids, liquids, and gases, all of which I've shown here expanding as they get hotter. And they do this because according to the kinetic molecular theory, more heat means more motion, and more motion means particles can overcome their attractions for each other and move further apart from one another. And as they move more, they collide more with each other and their surroundings, and that helps to push them apart. Even though we don't think of solids as, as getting bigger when we heat them, they do, and we'll do some labs that show that. And we know that particles move faster in a liquid when we heat them. That's why we saw that the dye that was hot spread out, I'm sorry, the water that was hot spread out the dye faster. And we're going to find also when we do our labs that we will be able to expand and, and contract a balloon just by changing the temperature of the air inside of it. Almost everything expands when heated. There are rare exceptions, but one really big exception is water. When water freezes, it expands instead of contracting, which is really, really weird, and is also why ice floats on top of liquid water, which most solids sink in their own liquid. So that's a really unusual thing for a substance to do, and if water didn't do that, a lot of things on Earth that we take for granted would not even be possible. Thermal expansion has a lot of interesting applications in the real world. So a couple of examples. One example that gets brought up in the book is a thermometer. Thermometers work by using or taking advantage of thermal expansion. The thermometers we have in our classroom have a liquid in a bulb, a glass bulb, at the bottom of a long uh, skinny tube of glass. And in the bulb, we have, the liquid that we have is alcohol. Way back in the day, we used to use mercury. Some people still do. But mercury is kind of a poison, so we don't bring it into schools anymore if we can avoid it. So when the molecules of mercury or alcohol or whatever's in there are relatively cool, even in the liquid state, they're pretty close together. They're moving. They're rotating around each other. If we heat them up, they move faster and they spread apart. Because we chose a liquid that expands a lot when it's heated, and also because we have it in a tiny little narrow tube, the only place for that liquid to go if it starts to expand is up the tube. And if we carefully measure out how much, uh, most, how much heat it takes to make it go up a certain amount, we get a thermometer. So thermometers work on thermal expansion. We have to think about thermal expansion when we build things. You probably realize when you go over a bridge, for example, that the bridge is put together not just with concrete, but also with bits of metal. And the deal is that when it gets really hot, metal and concrete both expand. And so if you want that bridge to maintain its structure, you have to have something built into the bridge that allows the bridge to expand and contract without breaking anything. And that's where these things come in. They're called expansion joints. And you can see they're kind of like metal teeth that are connected to each other. And there's room at the ends of each tooth for them to expand when it gets hot and contract when it's cold and yet still hold the bridge together. And that's really important, otherwise all our bridges would be falling down. Falling down. And they are anyway because we you know, need to make repairs to this system because after a while all that expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting starts to wear out the integrity of the material and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just normal wear and tear. One of my favorite thermal expansion tricks that my mother taught me way before I was ever a science teacher is this one. If you can't get a metal lid off of a glass jar, try running it under hot water. Not only is this likely to loosen any food particles that might be clinging to the sides, like you know, let's say you have syrup or something, it's also going to make that metal lid expand much more than the glass will. Glass is not easily expanded like metals are, and so as you heat that lid, it gets bigger and it's easier to remove it from the jar. And that's it for section 8-1. I hope that helped you understand the reading packet a little more, and maybe I'll see you in 8-2.